This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. We've been looking at the promises of Christmas. In the three main Christmas stories, the first one that deals with Mary and how she finds out that she is with child or going to be with child, and Joseph, who had decided that he needed to do the right thing and divorce her quietly, and then uh, God intervenes in his life, and he discovers what, what the truth is. And then today, the shepherd story. In each of those stories, there are three promises that are given not only to the participants in the story, but to us also. They're applicable promises that we can take and put uh, to use in our lives. And today we're looking at three more. So let's get started in, into our study and look at uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. <clears throat> and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now I want you to notice something. The host, the host being all of the angels, the host hadn't shown up yet. One angel showed up, and they were completely surrounded by light. That is an awful lot of, of power. So this one angel shows up, and they're surrounded uh, by this incredible light, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, and by the way, that verse says that they, that wasn't all of the angels. It says a multitude of the heavenly host. So in other words, it was part of the heavenly host. All of these angels showed up all at one time and began praising God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying, that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, let's get right into these three promises that are given to us, because these are life-changing if you can take them and apply them in your life. And remember, any time that there is a promise, a promise is the revelation of God's will. It's what God wants. If he makes a promise, says, I want you to do this, or I, I want you to have this, what he's saying is, this is my will. So one of the ways that you discover God's will is by discovering his promises. If you're having trouble knowing God's will, get into the promises that are in the word of God, because that's where you start. That's how you discover what it is that God's will is for your life. Over 6,000 promises that apply to you individually. And you can take these and start applying them in your life. So here's the first one, and it's the promise of joy. The promise of joy. Luke 2, verses 10 through 11, talks about that joy. And it says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all the people. Now, what is joy besides being joy's name? Joy is something that means something that we need to understand and use in our life. Joy is, the Greek word for joy is kara. And it has various implications and meanings. It can mean anything from gladness or delight. It's not happiness, but it can be gladness or delight all the way to a a, a personal clarity or a peaceful clarity or illumination. It can mean any of those things. So how do you receive joy, which is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as defined in Galatians? Well, let's look at where it begins. There is no clearer verse, Luke 2, verse 11, There is no clearer verse in the Bible that defines who Jesus is. He is the Lord who came to save. To this uh, this day, a Savior is born who is Christ the Lord. He is the Lord who is a Savior. Lord is who He is. Salvation is what He does. And you can't receive salvation and forgiveness for your sin unless you receive the deliverer of that salvation and forgiveness, which is Christ the Lord. And it is that salvation that brings joy. The the joy in your life begins with the salvation. 
Psalm 20, verses 4 and 5 says, May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Isaiah 12, 3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So joy begins with salvation, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which begins with what Christ did for you. Habakkuk chapter 3 says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no good, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice, it's another word for joy, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation." God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Now, let me ask you something. Are you struggling a bit with getting into the joy of Christmas? A lot of people are. Christmas is really tough for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of reasons. I've heard many, many Christians say, and I've heard even some of you say something to this extent, that you just dislike Christmas. You hate the Christmas season. Uh, because it's the most depressing time of the year. For some of you, it was even difficult to get up this morning and come to church knowing that it was Christmas Sunday. I understand that, actually. It's difficult to be joyful in difficult times. But listen to this. It's not difficult to find joy. It can be difficult to be joyful, but it's not difficult to find joy. And some of you have been struggling with finding joy this holiday season. And it seems like every year, the more things get just out of whack and and the weird, the stranger things get in the world, and the more difficult times get, you know, in our lives, that we have less and less joy in the holiday season. Or it takes us longer to, to get into that place of real joy. Well, how do you find joy? I want to give you four steps to joy, and I want you to write these down and think about these. These are four things, and you can do these even today. In fact, you can do these while I'm teaching this. Four things that will lead you to discover joy in your life. You can find joy, and once you find joy, then you can be joyful. The first thing is, the first step is that you need to, as I've already mentioned, focus on your salvation. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Focus on your salvation. It all starts there. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Why does it start with your salvation? Because your salvation proves how much you are worth to God. Think about that. Your salvation proves how much you are worth to God. The fact that God would come to earth and die on a cross to save you for, from your sin, to save you from the penalty from your sin, the fact that God would be willing to do that says a lot about how much you as an individual are worth. Now, the rest of the world isn't going to treat you with much worth. In fact, you may not treat yourself with much worth and value. But God did and does. You are of tremendous worth to God. And so your, your salvation proves how much you are worth to God, how much God really does love you. You are very much like those shepherds when you've lost your joy. You're just going through the motions, doing what you're supposed to do, not really getting that much out of life. But check this out. It's interesting to note that much of Western culture has misquoted this multitude of the heavenly host, uh, the angels, that uh, of what they said to the shepherds. After the angels spoke, then they were joined by this multitude of the host. They did not say, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. They didn't say that. What they did say was, peace on earth, eudokia, man. And eudokia is that word which means delightful purpose. That's what the word means. So what those angels said was, Uh, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, 
peace to men with a delightful purpose. The NIV says it this way, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And for those of you who, who may not be familiar with what I'm saying is the NIV is the New International Version of the Bible. So that translation phrases it this way, <coughs> glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. It's a good translation. This was an amazing statement to the shepherds. They must have pondered that statement over and over, on whom his favor rests. Us? We're shepherds. What do you mean on whom his favor rests? What do you mean someone who has a, 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 someone who has a delightful purpose? What, what, what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean that God has a delightful purpose for me? What? Angels. Oh, did you see that, Fred? I think one of the shepherds' name was Fred. Did you see that, Fred? All of those angels said that there's a delightful purpose for us. Now, how could that be? They were just shepherds. They were nobodies. They weren't worth the breath to say their names. They were considered the losers of society. They had nothing. In fact, most of them, or some of them at least, but probably most of them were homeless. In fact, in my opinion, one of the best ways to understand who the shepherds were in that culture is to compare them to the homeless around our city who live under bridges and just live from day to day. You want to know what the shepherds were like? Look at the homeless people that we see every day. What a delightful, uh, what delightful purpose could they possibly have by serving God? What was this delightful purpose that they were talking about? Think about a homeless person who lives under the bridge, seeing an angel coming to them and saying, God has a delightful purpose for you. God has favor on your life. Think about what that would have meant to that person. What delightful purpose could they possibly serve God? Why would his favor rest on them? Some of you are feeling like one of those shepherds. You feel like you've lost your value. You feel like you're not worth much to other people or to the world, maybe even to yourself. As far as society goes, you're pretty low down. But I'm here to tell you that God has an eudokia for you. He has a delightful purpose for your life. That's why he saved you. That's why you received salvation, because God is up to something in your life. Your salvation, even though you made the choice to respond to God, it was for God. Your salvation isn't, isn't just about you. It is for God. God saved you for his purposes, not for your purposes. God's favor rests on you. His delight isn't about you. It's about what you're going to accomplish for him. That's where his delight is. His delight is in the fact that he gets to spend eternity with you. He's more excited about it than you are. The reason he came was he couldn't stand the idea of spending eternity without you. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. And that fact it, it proves that he's in charge and he is up to something in your life. In spite of the fact that you may not feel like you have joy, God's still up to something. What a life-changing a life-changing experience for the for the shepherds to hear two incredible things that night. First of all, that the Messiah was born, which was radical. I mean, it was a, it was what they'd been waiting for for centuries and centuries for the Messiah to be born, and for angels to suddenly appear and say, "A Messiah is born." Now, I can't help but wonder if the shepherds didn't think, "Boy, did these angels appear to everybody?" Because I mean, they filled the whole sky. You know, didn't, did they appear to everybody? But they didn't. They later found out that they didn't. But they discovered that the Messiah was born. But here was the second thing that they discovered that night, was that God had a delightful purpose for their life. Notice how they, how they respond. Look at the, the awe in their response to this. Luke 2.15, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Wow. Let's go find out. We're told that we have a delightful purpose, and let's go find out what this is all about. 
The fact that God's favor has rested on us, and then, man, let's go check this out. There's something there. The same message applies to you. You need to discover this amazing truth about the Messiah and the fact that God does have a purpose, a delightful purpose for your life. There is favor on your life. So the first thing that we have to do, the first uh, thing that the, the, the first thing that we have to understand about uh, joy and that the first step toward joy is to focus on your salvation. The second step to joy is to come into the presence of God. Luke 2:16, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Look at this magnificent passage from when David returned the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. It's in 1 Chronicles. I want you to see something here. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for, the, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. You'll never know joy until you come into his place. His presence. The only way you can find joy is to come into the presence of God. Now I want you to notice two very important things about joy. First of all, joy is always the result of worship. You see, in the presence of God, there is nothing but worship. Outside of the presence of God, there is no worship. This morning when you came to worship corporately, and you should worship individually all the time, but when you came to worship corporately, if you were not in the presence of God during that worship time, you didn't worship. You went through the motions and emotions, but you didn't worship. Because worship only happens in the presence of God, and outside of the presence of God, there is no worship. And so when you come into the presence of God, there is worship, and joy is the result of worship. Look at this, Psalm 33, 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Psalm 35, 27. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord and who delights in the welfare of his servant. Joy is the result of worship. Now, here's the second thing. Joy is always the result of something that God does within you. Look at Isaiah 49, 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. In other words, when God brings comfort in your life, when God brings compassion into your life, when you're worshiping and you discover that, it results in joy. When you discover God's compassion, when you discover God's comfort. Psalm 5, verses 11 and 12, But let all who take refuge in you, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and Spread your protection over them. For that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Look at all those things that God does, which results in joy. You spread protection over them. You bless the righteous. You cover him with favor. Those things result in joy. If you haven't seen God doing that in your life, you're not experiencing joy. You might be happy. You might kind of feel warm in your tummy. But joy, real joy, is the result of understanding that God's at work in your life, that God's up to something, even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't see it. But you know God's there. I'm worth something to him. He has a purpose, a divine, a delightful purpose for my life. God is up to something in my life. I don't know what it is, but I know he's up to something in my life. The third step to joy is ask God to deliver you. This is such an important part of joy. 
I'm amazed a number of times when I talk to people who are struggling with this point of joy and there is no joy in their life. I say, well, have you asked God for joy? What do you mean? I thought it just kind of happened. No. You have to ask for joy. I want you to see something. For years, while the Hebrews had been in captivity, they had prayed for release. They were being held by the Assyrian kingdom. And they had been, they had been praying for freedom for years. And finally, God answered that prayer, and it's recorded in Ezra chapter 6. Look at this. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean, so they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for the fellow priests and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. They had been praying for freedom, and God answered miraculously, even to the point where they needed to come back to the homeland and build the temple, and the king provided the funds for it. You know, it's very similar to when the Israelites escaped, not escaped, well, they did escape, but they were freed from Egypt. Remember the Pharaoh? They gave them all their gold, and they gave them so, get out of here, take this stuff with you, go, just leave. It was amazing how God provided over and over and over again. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, who was born into abject poverty, was visited by magi who brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh, very expensive products that would support them when they went to Egypt and they provided a living for them. God does that. God provides, but it started by them asking God. And when God delivered them, it brought joy. They worshiped, it says, for seven days with joy, and the Lord had made them joyful. Joy is always the result of worship. It's always the result of God doing something within you, and it's always the result of asking God for joy. We've already looked at this next verse, but it's worth looking at again to note that it is a request to God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's asking, God, bring joy back into my life. Restore to me joy. Ask God to restore your joy. Ask him. Ask him to restore your joy. I want to do something here for just a few minutes. And I know you're going to feel just a little awkward doing this, but I don't care. Um, I want us to pray quietly, silently, not pray out loud. I don't want anybody to pray out loud. I'm not asking you to pray out loud. But there are people in this room who have not found joy this year. They're struggling. And I'd like for us, you don't know who they are. You may know who some of them are, but you don't know who all of them are. And I want us to pray for these people. But I want you, if you're one of those people that just hasn't really found your joy this year, I want you to pray and ask God to bring joy into your life. Ask him for it. And here's how we're going to do it. You're sitting around tables, or you're maybe sitting in, in a row of chairs. And I'm going to ask you just quietly, if you're comfortable doing this, you don't have to do this, but I'm asking you to do this. I'm going to ask you just quietly, I'm going to ask you to hold hands. And I'm going to ask you just for, we're going to pray for maybe one minute, two minutes. And I'm going to ask you to pray for the person on either side of you. Just quietly, I want you to, but not, not, not yet. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to tell you what to pray for. But I want you just to quietly hold that person's hand and pray, for the, first of all, for the person on your right. So let's do that. Pray for that person right now and ask God to really minister in that person. Pray for the person on your right, that person. And if there's no one to your right, pray for somebody else in the room. Ask God to really minister in their life, to speak to them that they might discover joy. Ask God to minister to the issues that they're dealing with in their own life that have prevented them from finding joy.
and ask God to release them. And I want you to confirm with that person that you've prayed that for them by just gently squeezing their hand. Now, for the person on the left, pray the same way. Acknowledge that there are issues in their lives that God needs to show himself. If God's at work in their lives, if he's up to something, that he'll reveal that he's up to something in their life. And pray that God will minister to their needs that he'll bring joy to their life, that he'll bring release. And when you're done praying that, would you just gently squeeze their hand? Now, I want you now to pray for yourself. And here's how you're going to pray. Acknowledge that God is up to something in your life, even if you can't see it, even if you don't know what it is. Acknowledge that God loves you, he saved you, he is up to something in your life. Ask him to speak to the difficulties and the problems and the concerns and the fears in your life. Some of you have gone through incredible losses this year. You've lost a mate, you've lost a parent, you've lost a child, you've lost a friend, you've lost a job. You've just, there are things that have happened in your life that have just really decimated you. Ask God to speak through those things to give you courage to stand for what it is that he wants to accomplish in and through your life. God knew those things were going to happen before the foundations of the earth and he still has a purpose and a plan for your life. Ask him to do that, accomplish that in your life. And then ask him now to just simply restore your joy. Father, there are hurting hearts all over this room people who need to hear from you, people who are waiting on you, people who need to have their joy restored. Lord, would you speak to their hearts, speak to their minds, give them a sense of focus that you are on the throne, you are in control, you are up to something in their lives, that you have found favor with them, that you have a delightful purpose for them. Father, begin to illumine their lives to help them understand that it's about what you're doing. It's about what you're up to. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now, what do you do next? You've taken three steps of joy. You know, the the first step is that you focus on your salvation. The second step is that you come into the presence of God. The third step is that you ask God to deliver you, but what about the fourth step? Well, the fourth step is that you celebrate what God has done. Now, what does that mean? The Bible says the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Well, how should you celebrate what God has done? Let me give you two ways. There are others, but I'm going to give you two. First one, you go your way. I didn't say go away. I said you go your way. You go your way. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Now stop right there. They had come, they had come back, and the, and the, the walls had, been, had fallen down, and they needed to rebuild it and restore, really, their, their culture. And Nehemiah and all these people came together, and they led them to do that. And they finally did it, and the words, were, and, and, and the words of, of uh, the, really the Torah were read to them. The words of the law were read to them, and they weeped, mostly in repentance, I think, because they discovered that God really was up to something, and they weren't sure what to do about it. And they, the Bible says that they were, they were weeping, they were mourning, they were grieving. Then he said to them, 
Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For the day, does that sound familiar? For the day, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, notice how God wants them to celebrate. It's in that one verse there, verse 10. Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Now, by the way, the term sweet, I know some of you are getting all excited, but the term sweet wine uh, is a poor translation. In fact, the word wine isn't even in the original. Uh, The word used is mamtakim. Mamtakim, and mamtakim is a word which means sweetness. That's all it means. That's exactly what the word means. It means sweetness. And there's only one other place in the Bible where there is a similar word, a version of that word. It's mantak, mantak. And it's in Song of Solomon, verses, chapter 5, verse 16. And it says, his mouth is most mantak, is most sweet. Marcia says that to me all the time. <laughs> um, but those, but, so, so the term sweet wine is, is really a, a poor translation. It just means something sweet. So, and it may have been some sort of sweet drink. I don't know. But it's just referring to sweetness. And it may have just been a, a word that they used for some particular food type. But anyway, the term sweet wine is a poor translation, and, and I just wanted you to catch that. So notice what it is that God wants the people who were sad and grieving to do. People who had no joy. Notice what it is that he wants them to do. He tells them to go your way. In other words, go live life. Go live life. Go live life. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to enjoy life. It's okay to enjoy it. You're enjoying it too much. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you are to enjoy life. My goodness, what is it about us that says, oh, I can't really have fun because, you know, I'm, you know people will talk. <laughs> yeah, they will. Look at him. He's having fun. What's wrong? I'm not having fun. You know, I I'm, I'm really do believe that one of the reasons that we are failures in, in our witness and our testimony is because we don't have fun. I really believe that. I really believe that God wants us to go our way, to live life to the absolute fullest. What is it that you can do to live life to the fullest? You know, I get tickled at Randy Shepard, who, uh, by the way, Randy's teaching next Sunday. It'll be interesting to see what he's going to teach on, because I'm going to be leading worship in, in, in the service. But Randy's going to be teaching next Sunday. Randy is nuttier than a fruitcake. I mean, some of you know this. Amen. Amen. You know what the guy does? The guy deep sea dives. God did not create you to dive underwater. You do not have gills. And he goes diving underwater and loves it. And I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes he misses church to do that. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay. You know, God says that he, want, he created, he's, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You are to have a joy in your life. You are to live life to the fullest. You are to enjoy life. That's what the Bible says. And that's what Nehemiah was telling him. It says, go your way. Go live your life. Go live life. And then he says, go enjoy good food and sweet things. And then notice what he says, and share with others who don't have that. Get that? That's one of the ways that you celebrate what God's done. You live life to the fullest, but you don't neglect in taking care of the people who aren't enjoying life. Take care of those who don't have it. Go make someone else's life better. The other, way to celebrate, the other way to celebrate God's presence is to spend time looking beyond the sorrow. Now, this is a very practical thing I want you to get. It's not take your eyes off the problem, because you can't do that, let's be honest. 
When you're struggling and you're suffering and there's pain and there's hurt and uh, there's disillusionment in your life, you can't stop looking at it. But you can look beyond it to see some other things also. You can increase the scope of your vision and take in a couple of things. Number one, note the wonder of God's creation. Psalm 92, 4, look at this. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Isn't that awesome? God, I can look at what you've done. I can see your incredible starry creation. I can look at the mountains. I can, I can, I can look at the beauty of, of your creation in, in, in the woods and the forest and the flowers. I can see the, your handiwork. And Lord, it's amazing. And I can sing for joy because of what you have done. Your creation, God, is amazing. Spend some time hugging a tree. I'll make fun of you for it, but it's okay. It's okay. Enjoy God's creation. The second part of that is, the second th- the way that you look beyond your sorrow is not only looking at God's creation, but remember the works of God in the past. You know, God's worked in your life, hasn't he? He's done some things in your, in your life, in your past. He has affected your life in the past. Don't forget that. Don't be so busy looking at what's wrong in your life and stop looking at what's right. Don't do that. It's important not only to understand that there are things that need to be dealt with in your life, some problems, some issues. It's okay. But look beyond that and increase the scope of your vision so that you also see what God has done, what he is doing in your life. And what he is up to, it must be up to, because he did this before, so why would he have done that if he didn't plan to do something else? I mean, why did God do those things in your life just to walk away from you? It wasn't like God was patting you on the head. God doesn't pat anybody on the head. He prepares you. He prepares you. Everything that God does has a purpose and a plan, which means that there's a follow-up to what God wants to do. Everything that God does in your life has a follow-up. God does this because he wants to do this, because he wants to do this, because he wants to do this, because he w- Why did you think that God stopped way back here doing stuff in your life? That would mean that God had not completed what he wanted to do in your life. Everything that God does in your life has a purpose, which leads to something else that God wants to do that has a purpose, which leads to something else that God wants to do. Everything. Remember the works of God in the past. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all you have done. I ponder the work of your hands, Psalm 143, 5. The works of God's creation and his works of the past in your life serve as a sign of God's faithfulness. But God also gives signs of the fact that he is in control and that he is up to something, which brings us to the second promise of this passage. And I'm going to move through these last two promises very quickly. The second promise that's given in this passage is that there's a promise of a sign. The angel said to him, uh, to the shepherds, and this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The sign that the shepherds would note would confirm the message of the angel. In other words, when they saw the baby in swaddling clothes, it would confirm what they had experienced. Wow, this is right. Exactly what the angel said. And the sign would verify that they had found the Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's why the angel gave him a sign. The sign was a confirmation. When you see this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, it will be a confirmation that you have discovered the Messiah, the Savior of the world. They were, there were actually two signs in the story. The first sign was the appearance of God's messengers, the angels. The first, uh, first there was one angel, and then the Bible says there was this heavenly host that filled the sky. As far as the eye could see in any direction, the angels proclaiming the glory of God. That was the first sign that something was happening. God was up. I mean, wouldn't you get that idea? So the shepherds saw two signs that night, the immense and impressive display of angels and 
the intensely symbolic and disturbing sign of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. I want you to get this. I say intensely and disturbing sign of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes because the shepherds knew what swaddling clothes were all about. It meant something to the shepherds. You see, the swaddle, and the shepherds knew this, the swaddle in those days, the swaddle was used when a sacrificial lamb was born. And the swaddle, they would wrap the sacrificial, the lamb was perfect, and they would wrap this swaddle around the lamb so it wouldn't thrash around and bruise itself. Because if it bruised, bruised itself, it was unusable for the sacrifice. So they would take the swaddle and they would, this cloth, and these strips of cloth, and they, they would use it to, you know, deliver the lamb, and then they would wrap that lamb up in the swaddle and hold it nice and tight so that it wouldn't thrash around and hurt itself, preparing it for the sacrifice. In fact, that is probably how the shepherds knew where to go. I mean, Bethlehem wasn't that big of a town, but it wasn't like they went into Bethlehem and started knocking on doors and saying, is the Messiah here, is the Messiah here, is the Messiah here? They went right to the place where the baby was. They knew. How did they know? Well, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were most likely in the birthing stable of sacrificial lambs because that's where the swaddle was. There wouldn't have been any swaddling cloths in, in another stable that wasn't used for that purpose. The fact that they were in that particular location and there was swaddle there, swaddling clothes for the baby, meant that that was what was going on in that particular location. So where they were, where Mary and Joseph and Jesus were, was this location where lambs were birthed for the sacrifice and wrapped in swaddling cloths and held tight so that they wouldn't bruise themselves and be unusable for the sacrifice. So that sign was amazing to the, to the shepherds, very disturbing at the same time. Why would you wrap a baby for a sacrifice? The third promise is the promise of a ministry. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And then verse 20 says, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as, they had, as it had been told them. So they got this sign. They got this confirmation. And by the way, God confirms things in your life also. He confirms his will in your life. The Bible teaches that over and over and over again. He is in the business of confirming his will. So look for signs. Look for confirmations. When you believe that God has led you to something, look for confirmation. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. And he says, the Bible says, he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, what that means is he will put his desires in your heart. He will motivate you, in other words, to do what it is he wants you to do. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will put his desires in your heart. Well, then you have that sense, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is, what I, this is what I'm supposed to accomplish, but how do I know? Wait for the confirmation. Look for a confirmation. It will be there. God says, I will confirm it. There is a confirmation. Look for the sign. But also recognize that the sign is always connected to the ministry. And for the shepherds, they received a sign, but it also gave them a ministry. I want you to notice something. When did the shepherds discover their ministry? It wasn't in the busy and frantic run of the day that the angels came to the shepherds. It was at night. It was at night when they found the Messiah. It wasn't in the hustle and bustle of the day. It was at night. It wasn't during the routine of the day that an angel spoke to Abraham in his sad desperation in Genesis 15 about not, not having a child. It was at night that God spoke to him. It wasn't in the hectic planning of the day that God met Jacob as he prepared to face his brother that he thought was about to attack and kill him, as recorded in Genesis 32. It was at night. And it was at night while Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that he found some strength to face the coming day. It was at night. It is in the darkest moments of your life 
those times when you are most vulnerable, those times when you are most despondent, those times when you have no joy, those times when you can't see what's ahead, those times when it is dark in your life, it is in those times, in the night of your life, it is those times when God begins to reveal himself. It's in the chaos of your life or in a time of no joy that you need to find a place and time to meet God. And once you've met him, once you've worshipped the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Messiah, and God begins to restore a bit of joy in your life, you'll never be the same. God will use your experience to change the world just as he did with the shepherds who went out and told everybody, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They found a ministry. These guys who were the dregs of society, the bottom of the food chain, these guys who were nothing within just a matter of hours, moved from nothing to ministers of the kingdom. And God anointed that and blessed them so that all who heard their story were amazed and wondered at it. Wow, could this really be? <coughs> they were, I mean, they went from nothing to a ministry in nothing flat. Do you realize the same thing could happen in your life today? It can it absolutely can. These lowly, worthless, bottom of the barrel of society, simple shepherds on whom God rested his favor, for whom God had a delightful purpose, were never the same again, and they changed their world. Let me tell you something. They were the early believers. Think about this. We talk about the church was born in Acts and you know, received the Holy Spirit, but weren't the shepherds in a sense, the first church, in a sense, because they discovered the Messiah and who he was, and they went out and proclaimed the word. They found a ministry. They went back to their world glorifying, the Bible says, glorifying, which means revealing the presence of God, and praising. That means adoring God for who he is. They went back glorifying and praising, and they went back and changed their world, it's according to verse 18. I love what verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So altogether this Christmas season, we've seen nine Christmas promises that God has given us. Number one, the promise of a Savior. Number two, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the promise of a confirmation. Number four, the promise of protection. Number five, the promise of a plan. Number six, the promise of direction. Number seven, the promise of joy. Number eight, the promise of a sign. And number nine, the promise of a ministry. I want to tell you something. What amazing gifts that God has given you this Christmas. Let's pray. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. 